In chapter 19, we will examine the cardiovascular system, but this time we will focus on the heart. The heart is found immediately behind the sternum, situated between the lungs within the mediastinum, which also holds the great vessels, the thymus, esophagus, and trachea. The heart is about the size of a clenched fist. It is shaped like an inverted cone with a pointed apex orient, oriented down and the broad flat base oriented up. A typical adult heart measures approximately five inches from the base to the apex. Looking at the heart from this view, you can see the, where the heart is located within the thoracic cavity. A mid-sagittal section through the trunk does not divide the heart into two equal halves, however, because the center lies slightly to the left of the midline with the apex pointed toward the left rib cage and the base pointed towards the right shoulder, which you can see in the figure, the heart is positioned more to the left side of the body. The entire heart is also rotated so that the right atrium and right ventricle dominate the anterior view of the heart. Here's another view of the heart. The anterior view of the heart also illustrates the borders of the heart. The base forms the superior border. The right border of the heart is formed by the right atrium. The left border of the heart is formed by the left ventricle and a small portion of the left atrium. And the inferior border is formed mainly by the inferior wall of the right ventricle. In this chapter, we will also relate the heart anatomy to the physiology of the heart, and you can see some of the physiology that we will talk about in the EKG shown in the figure. If the heart should stop, CPR can be performed to maintain the flow of blood until the heart resumes beating. The instructions for performing CPR can be found in this educational video. By applying pressure to the sternum, the blood within the heart will be squeezed out of the heart and into the circulation. In addition, proper positioning of the hands on the sternum to perform CPR would be between the lines at T4 and T9. Here you can see the chambers of the heart and circulation through the heart. Blood flows from the right atrium to the right ventricle via the right atrioventricular valve or tricuspid valve and from the right ventricle enters the pulmonary artery on its way to the pulmonary circuit to become reoxygenated and comes back to the heart into the left atrium via the pulmonary veins and goes from the left atrium through the left atrioventricular valve, which is also known as the bicuspid or mitral valve into the left ventricle. From there, it goes into the aorta. Here you can see the pericardial membranes and layers around the heart. The heart wall contains three layers. The endocardium, which is the inner surfaces of the heart, including those of the heart valves, are covered by the endocardium which is a simple squamous epithelium and underlying areolar tissue. The squamous epithelial lining of the cardiovascular system is called the endothelium. The endothelium of the heart is continuous with the endothelium of the attached great vessels. The myocardium is the muscular wall of the heart and forms both the atria and the ventricles, 
This middle layer contains concentric layers of cardiac muscle tissue as well as blood vessels and nerves. The atrial myocardium contains muscle bundles that wrap around the atrium and form a figure eight that encircles the great vessels. The superficial ventricular muscles wrap around both the ventricles while deeper muscle layers spiral around between the ventricles toward the apex in a figure eight pattern. The epicardium, also known as the visceral layer of the serous pericardium, covers the outer surface of the heart. This serous membrane consists of an exposed mesothelium and an underlying layer of areolar connective tissue that is attached to the myocardium. The heart is also surrounded by several membranes. A fibrous pericardium, which is a tough, loose-fitting outer membrane. A serous pericardium, a double-layered inner serous membrane, which consists of a parietal layer, and that is the outer layer of the serous pericardium. And the visceral layer, which is the inner layer and is equivalent to the epicardium, which also serves as the outer wall of the heart. Between the parietal and visceral layers of the serous pericardium is a space called the pericardial cavity, and it contains pericardial fluid. During each beat, the heart changes size and shape. The pericardial cavity permits these changes and the slippery pericardial lining prevents friction between the heart and the adjacent structures. The relationship between the heart and the pericardial cavity resembles that of a fist pushing into a balloon. The wrist corresponds to the base of the heart and the balloon corresponds to the lining of the pericardial cavity. Cardiac tamponade is shown here, and this is when fluid builds up in the pericardial cavity surrounding the heart. Here we can see the external anatomy of the heart, and we can also see many of the vessels that serve the heart. There are um, two upper chambers of the heart, the atrium, both right and left, and two lower pumping chambers, the ventricles, both right and left. Each atrium possesses an outer expandable extension called an auricle. The atrium are separated by an inner wall called the interatrial septum. The right atrium has a shallow depression called the fossa ovalis, which marks the location of the former hole in the interatrial septum called the foramen ovale, present during embryonic development. The anterior wall and the inner surface of the auricle contain specialized myocardial ridges called pectinate muscles. The right atrium receives deoxygenated blood from the body while the left atrium receives oxygenated blood from the lungs. The right and left ventricles are separated by a thick partition called the interventricular septum. The right ventricle is relatively thin-walled, resembling a pouch attached to the massive wall of the left ventricle. Such a thin wall is adequate because the right ventricle only needs to pump blood out to the lungs, which is the pulmonary circuit. The left ventricle is three times more muscular than the right ventricle and is round in cross-section. It develops more pressure to pump blood around the body, the systemic circuit. And the inner surfaces of the ventricles possess a series of large, irregular, muscular ridges called trabeculae carnae. Here you can see a different view of the muscle and heart layers that we spoke about previously.
And in this view, you can see the difference in the right ventricle versus the left ventricle. Noting the difference in the ventricular muscle thickness. The internal anatomy of the heart is shown here, where you can see the fossa ovalis, the pectinate muscles, and the trabeculae carnae, as well as the interventricular septum that I just spoke about. Now the valves of the heart are shown here. The atrioventricular valves also called the AV valves, separate each atrium from its corresponding ventricle. The free edge of each valve consists of two or more flaps called cusps. The cusps are in turn attached to tendinous connective tissue fibers called chordae tendinae. These fibers originate at conical muscular projections called papillary muscles. The chordae tendinae and papillary muscles work together to prevent inversion of the AV valves during contraction of the heart and thereby prevent backflow. There are two types of AV valves, tricuspid, which possesses three cusps, which allows the flow of blood from the right atrium to the right ventricle, but prevents backflow during ventricular contraction. The bicuspid, also called the mitral valve, possesses only two cusps and allows the flow of blood from the left atrium to the left ventricle, but prevents backflow during ventricular contractions. The semilunar valves separate each ventricle from the vessels that exit them. The semilunar valves are each made of three crescent-shaped pocket-like cusps. There are two types of semilunar valves. The pulmonary semilunar valve, sometimes simply called the pulmonary valve, separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary trunk and its branches, the pulmonary arteries. The aortic semilunar valve, sometimes called, simply called the aortic valve, separates the left ventricle from the aorta. When the valves are relaxed, the chordae tendinae are loose and the papillary muscles are relaxed so that the AV valves are standing open and offer no resistance to the flow of blood from the atria into the ventricles. The high pressure in the pulmonary circuit and systemic circuit keeps the semilunar valves closed. When the ventricles contract, Blood moving back toward the atria push the cusp of the AV valves together, closing them and preventing backflow. At the same time, the contraction of the papillary muscles tends the chordae tendinae, stopping the cusp before they invert. As the pressure within the ventricles rise above that in the pulmonary and systemic circuits, the semilunar valves open and the blood is ejected out of the ventricles and into the corresponding blood vessels. And there is also some embedded links in the valves of the heart where you can see the heart sounds animation and a heart echocardiogram. Here you can see the support that I noted with the AV valves, the chordae tendinae, and papillary muscles. Now the coronary circuit is shown here. We previously mentioned the blood flow through the chambers of the heart. The pulmonary circuit is where deoxygenated blood from the body flows into the right atrium via the superior vena cava inferior vena cava, and coronary sinus. And the pulmonary circuit will continue into the pulmonary trunk, which branches into the right and left pulmonary arteries 
transporting the deoxygenated blood to the lungs where it picks up oxygen. The systemic circuit is where the oxygenated blood leaves the lungs by traveling in the left and right pulmonary veins into the left atrium, goes into the left ventricle, and then out of the left ventricle via the aortic valve into the aorta and out into the body. In the coronary circuit, while most of the oxygenated blood ejected into the aorta flows out to the body, some of it is transported to the walls of the heart. At the base of the aorta are two branches. The right coronary artery sits in the coronary sulcus around the heart and supplies blood to the right atrium, portions of both ventricles, and portions of the conducting system of the heart. It has two branches that are of importance, the marginal arteries and posterior interventricular artery. The left coronary artery supplies blood to the left ventricle, left atrium, and interventricular septum. It also has two branches of importance, the anterior interventricular artery and circumflex artery. Once the blood drops off oxygen to the walls of the heart, it must return to the heart chambers. Return is through veins. This would be the venous return. There are several veins of importance. The small cardiac vein, which runs parallel to the marginal arteries and right coronary artery. The middle cardiac vein, which runs parallel to the posterior interventricular artery. The great cardiac vein, which runs parallel to the anterior interventricular artery and circumflex artery. All three of these merge to form the coronary sinus, which drains into the right atrium along with the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Here you can see what happens when the coronary arteries become occluded or blocked. That blockage leads to a reduction in blood flow and can lead to the death of cardiac tissue if not corrected. Now let's examine cardiac muscle and the electrical activity of the heart. First let's look at the microscopic anatomy of cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle cells possess a single centrally located nucleus. They are uninucleated. Cardiac muscle cells are relatively small and columnar shaped. Unlike skeletal muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells branch. Cardiac muscle cells are metabolically very active and therefore possess large numbers of mitochondria and are rich, rich, richly supplied with capillaries. Cardiac muscle cells also possess striations because of the highly organized arrangement of the myofibrils into repeated sarcomeres. Approximately 1% of cardiac muscle cells are capable of generating their own electrical impulse and are therefore called autorhythmic. Cardiac muscle tissue possesses intercalated discs where the plasma membranes of two adjacent cardiac muscle cells are extensively intertwined and bound together by gap junctions and desmosomes. These connections help stabilize the relative positions of the adjacent cells. It also allows a direct electrical, chemical, and mechanical connection between the two muscle cells so that the cardiac muscle cells act as an enormous single cell. This ability to behave as a single coordinated unit is called a functional synctium. Cardiac muscle cell contraction lasts longer than skeletal muscle fiber contraction, primarily due to differences in membrane permeability. Calcium channels remain open in cardiac muscle cells for an extended period of time, resulting in a prolonged refractory period. 
Here you can see the conducting system of the heart. The conducting system is a network of specialized cardiac muscle cells responsible for initiating and distributing the stimulus to contract. The intrinsic cardiac conduction is where the cardiac muscle tissue contracts on its own even in the absence of neural or hormonal stimulation. This is because 1% of cardiac muscle tissue is autorhythmic. The sinoatrial node, or simply SA node, is embedded in the posterior wall of the right atrium near the entrance of the superior vena cava. The electrical impulse generated by this cardiac pacemaker is then distributed by other cells through the conducting system. Under normal conditions, the SA node generates an electrical impulse at 75 beats per minute. Internodal pathways distribute the contractile stimulus to the atrial muscle cells as the impulse travels towards the ventricles. The atrioventricular node, or simply AV node, is located at the junction between the atria and the ventricles. The AV node delivers the stimulus to the AV bundle. A 100 millisecond delay occurs at the AV node giving time for the atria to contract. The AV node also contains pacemaker cells, but they do not ordinarily affect the heart rate. If the SA node or internodal pathways are damaged, the AV node will generate impulses at a rate of 40 to 60 beats per minute. The AV bundle, located with the within the interventricular septum serves as the electrical connection between the atrium and the ventricles. The bundle leads to the right and left bundle branches. The right and left bundle branches extend toward the apex of the heart, turn, and fan out deep to the endocardial surface. The left bundle which serves the massive left ventricle is larger than the right bundle branch. Perkunji fibers are the final link in the distribution network and they are responsible for depolarization of the ventricular myocardial cells that trigger ventricular contraction. And here you can see the cardiac conducting system and the pathway that it travels. Each individual has a characteristic resting heart rate that varies with age, general health, and physical conditioning. However, there is a normal range of heart rates. The American Heart Association considers 60 to 100 beats per minute to be the homeostatic range of resting heart rates. The intrinsic heart rate can be altered by the autonomic activities of the extrinsic cardiac centers located within the medulla oblongata. These centers innervate the heart by means of the cardiac plexus and are further regulated by higher brain function from the hypothalamus. Cardio inhibitory centers control the parasympathetic neurons that slow the heart rate via the vagus nerve. Cardio accelerator centers controls the sympathetic neurons that increase the heart rate via the cardiac nerve. Here you can see the action potential in the cardiac conducting cell. And this demonstrates the slow influx of sodium ions until the threshold is reached and then we get a rapid depolarization and repolarization. You can also see the rapid influx of calcium that contributes to the depolarization of cardiac muscle tissue. Here you can see the action potential in the cardiac contractile cells. And what is also demonstrated is the long plateau phase, which leads to the extended refractory period, allowing the cells to fully contract before an ele another electrical event can occur.
This prevents tetanus or tetany from happening within heart muscle tissue. And you can also see the comparison of heart muscle to skeletal muscle in the bottom part of the figure. Skeletal muscle lacks the long refractory period that we see in cardiac tissue. Normal and abnormal electrical activity of the heart can be detected by an electrocardiogram. The electrical events occurring in the heart are powerful enough to be detected by electrodes on the surface of the body. A recording of these events over time is an electrocardiogram, also called an EKG. The appearance of the EKG varies with the placement of the monitoring electrodes or leads. And as you will see, there are distinct waves produced during a typical EKG a P wave, a QRS complex, and a T wave. This slide demonstrates some of the um, acute coronary syndromes that can be seen with an EKG. And this is also via an electrocardiogram with 12 leads. Here is an electrocardiogram which outlines the distinct waves that are produced. The P wave is a small wave that corresponds to the depolarization of the atria and triggers contraction of the atria about 25 milliseconds after the start of the P wave. Because atrial contraction is stimulated by the SA node, an abnormal P wave suggests a problem with the SA node or the ability of the atria to spread the electrical impulse generated by the SA node. A missing P wave suggests the SA node has failed. The QRS complex appears as the ventricles depolarize. This is a relatively strong electrical signal because the ventricles are so massive and therefore produces a large wave. The ventricles begin contracting shortly after the peak of the R wave. Because the AV node sends the electrical impulse to the ventricles, changes in the appearance of the QRS complex might suggest problems with the AV node, sometimes called a heart block. The T wave is a small wave that corresponds to ventricular repolarization. A separate wave reflecting atrial repolarization is not apparent because it occurs while the ventricles are depolarizing and is therefore masked by the QRS. The intervals between the waves can also be used for diagnostic purposes. The PR interval if this interval is greater than 200 milliseconds, it can indicate damage to the AV node. The QT interval, if there is an increase in the length of this interval, it is a strong indicator of an increased risk for heart attack and suggests ventricular tachycardia. Tachycardia is a condition in which the heart rate is faster than normal, generally greater than 100 beats per minute. Here you can see um, some differences in electrocardiograms and you can see the difference in the waves produced, both normal and abnormal. Here is also some common EKG abnormalities outlined. For example, the top figure shows a second degree or partial block one half of the P waves are not followed by the QRS complex and T waves while some are. You can also see atrial fibrillation and ventricular fibrillation as well as ventricular tachycardia and a third degree block. A first degree block is shown here.
second degree heart block, and finally, complete blockage. Artificial pacemakers can be implanted to assist with any problems with the heart rate or heart starting on its own. And you can see this device can be planted just below the skin inside of the ventricle wall. So if the heart rate is too low, bradycardia, that is a condition in which the heart rate is slower than normal, less than 60 beats per minute, someone might be eligible to have a pacemaker implanted. Defibrillators can also be used if there is problems with the heart to restart the heart. And typically these are used in hospital settings but you can find them um, in various other placements, office buildings, um, where they can be easily accessed should an emergency situation arise. Now let's look at the cardiac cycle. Each heartbeat is followed by a brief resting phase, which allows time for the chambers to relax and prepare for the next heartbeat and for oxygenated blood to be distributed to the walls of the heart. The period between the start of one heartbeat and the beginning of the next is a single cardiac cycle. The cardiac cycle therefore includes alternating periods of contraction and relaxation. Although we think of the heart as a pump, it is really four pumps working in pairs, and thus a heartbeat is a complicated event. The two atria contract first, pushing blood into the ventricles, and then the two ventricles contract, pushing blood through the pulmonary and systemic circuits and then to the atria again. For any one chamber in the heart, the cardiac cycle can be divided into two phases, systole or contraction and diastole or relaxation. A sequence of systole and diastole in either the atria or the ventricles that lasts 800 milliseconds and represents a heart rate of 75 beats per minute. Now let's look at the steps of the cardiac cycle. When the cardiac cycle begins, all four chambers are relaxed and the ventricles are partially filled with blood. The AV valves are open and the semilunar valves are closed. During atrial systole, the atria contract, completely filling the relaxed ventricles with blood. Atrial systole ends and atrial diastole begins and continues until the start of the next cardiac cycle. Also, as atrial systole ends, ventricular systole begins. And this phase can be further divided into two phases. Ventricular systole, the first phase, is where ventricular contraction pushes the AV valves closed, but does not create enough pressure to open the semilunar valves. This is known as the period of isovolumetric contraction. Ventricular systole, the second phase, is where eventually the contraction of the ventricles generates enough pressure to exceed the pressure in the arteries so that the semilunar valves open and blood is ejected out of the ventricles and into the pulmonary trunk, the pulmonary circuit, and the aorta, the systemic circuit. This is known as the period of ventricular ejection. Ventricular diastole has an early and late phase. In the early part, as the ventricles relax, the pressure in them drops. Blood flows back against the cusps of the semilunar valves, forcing them closed, but the pressure in the ventricles has not dropped low enough to allow the AV valves to open. As a result, blood flows into the relaxed atria but because the AV valves remain closed, it cannot flow into the ventricles. This is known as the period 
of isovolumetric relaxation. In late ventricle diastole, all chambers are relaxed again. The AV valves have opened and the ventricles are passively filling with blood from the atria to about 70% of their volume. The semilunar valves are also closed. And here you can see the relationship between the cardiac cycle and an electrocardiogram. Now let's examine the heart sounds. There are four heart sounds that are produced as a result of the cardiac cycle. S1, S2, S3, and S4. If you listen to or oscillate your own heart sounds with a stethoscope, you can clearly hear the first and second heart sounds. The first heart sound, known as the lub, S1, lasts a little longer than the second sound and corresponds to the AV valves closing during ventricular contraction. The second heart sound, known as the dub, or S2, corresponds to the semilunar valves closing during ventricular relaxation. The third and fourth heart sounds are usually faint and seldom audible in healthy, healthy adults. However, these sounds may be heard and can be associated with blood flowing into the ventricles, as with S3, and atrial contraction, as with S4. Abnormal heart sounds are called heart murmurs, such as during mitral valve prolapse. And you can also see the stethoscope's placement in order to oscillate or listen to the heart sounds. And you can see the, how the heart sounds. Now let's look at some of the physiology of the cardiovascular system. First, let's examine cardiac output. The goal of cardiovascular regulation is the maintenance of adequate blood flow to vital tissues. The best overall indicator of peripheral blood flow is cardiac output. Cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped by the left ventricle in one minute. Cardiac output depends on two factors, heart rate in beats per minute and stroke volume which is the amount of blood pumped out of the ventricles during a single heartbeat. The calculation of cardiac output is very straightforward. You simply multiply the heart rate times the average stroke volume. An example would be a heart rate of 75 beats per minute and a stroke volume of 80 milliliters per beat produces a cardiac output of approximately 6,000 milliliters per minute. There is various factors that can influence our heart rate or our stroke volume. Any change in heart rate or stroke volume can therefore impact cardiac output. Factors affecting heart rate can be body temperature, hormones, most notably epinephrine and thyroxine, emotional state, and stimulation of the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system. Factors affecting stroke volume are end diastolic volume and end systolic volume. Stroke volume, as you can see in the figure, is EDV or end diastolic volume minus ESV or end systolic volume. Preload is the amount of myocardial stretch permitting the ventricles to fill and is a factor which can affect stroke volume. The amount of blood in the ventricles at the end of ventricular diastole, which corresponds to the greatest potential for stretch, is called the end diastolic volume. As EDV increases, the ventricles must stretch to accommodate the large volume of blood. In other words, greater preload equals greater EDV, which equals greater stroke volume. This is sometimes called the Frank-Starling Law of the Heart. 
The afterload is the amount of tension the contracting ventricles must produce in order to force the semilunar valves open and to eject blood into the aorta. The greater the afterload, the longer the period of isovolumetric contraction, the sh which also indicates the shorter the duration of ventricular ejection and the larger the ESV or end systolic volume. In other words, as afterload increases, ESV increases, and therefore stroke volume decreases. Contractility refers to the amount of force or strength of contraction that is produced during a contraction at a given amount of preload. In other words, as contractility increases, ESV decreases and therefore stroke volume would increase. Many drugs used in clinical practice affect contractility including beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Here you can see the autonomic innervation of the heart which demonstrates the cardio accelerator and cardio inhibitory areas that I mentioned previously. You can also see the effects of sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation on normal sinus rhythm, where sympathetic stimulation can increase that rhythm and parasympathetic can decrease. This slide demonstrates the factors affecting stroke volume that I just mentioned. Here you can see preload, contractility, and afterload and how those factors will influence stroke volume. This is a summary of all of the major factors influencing cardiac output that we have just discussed. Fine, let's look at the development of the heart. This diagram outlines the embryological development of the human heart during the first eight weeks and the subsequent formation of the four heart chambers. Here we can see the fetal shunts that are in place to bypass the non-functioning lungs and liver during embryological development in utero. The foramen ovale which is in the interatrial septum, allows blood to flow from the right atrium to the left atrium, thereby bypassing the non-functioning fetal lungs. The ductus arteriosus is a temporary vessel connecting the aorta to the pulmonary trunk. In case any blood does get into the right ventricle, this shunt can allow blood to go from the pulmonary trunk into the aorta thereby again bypassing the fetal lungs. The ductus venosa links the umbilical vein to the inferior vena cava largely through the liver. Congenital heart defects are shown here. You can see a foramen ovale defect is an abnormal opening in the interatrial septum more commonly, a failure of the foramen ovale to close. There is also other congenital heart defects demonstrated in the figure, such as a patent ductus arteriosus, tetralogy of phallet, which includes an abnormal opening in the interventricular septum. Finally, there are some disorders or diseases of the cardiovascular system that you should be familiar with. Angina pectoris is chest pain related to coronary problems. Arthrosclerosis is plaque buildup, usually from fat and cholesterol, within the vessel. The plaque constricts the vessel, causing increased blood pressure and a reduction in elasticity. Endocarditis is inflammation of the innermost lining of the heart. Recent research has suggested poor oral hygiene 
can cause bacterial infection of the internal heart linings. Myocardial infarction is a heart attack caused by a blockage or disruption of normal blood flow through the coronary circulation. Pericarditis is inflammation of the pericardial membranes around the outside of the heart. And cardiac tamponade is excess fluid like blood when it accumulates in the pericardial cavity. This can restrict the movement of the heart by applying pressure on the outside. It can also lead to a drop in preload and hence a drop in cardiac output. This concludes our study of the cardiovascular system, the heart.